Jilla. My name is Jake DePoe, and I am a lower rogue to Tutney, with deep ties north and south along the coast of northwestern California and southern Oregon, extending north to lower Umpqua with Sixes and Coos in between, south to Toloa with Checo and Pistol River in between. My home village is Chemi, or Chemichuni, the canoe landing place on the north shore of the Rogue River where it meets the ocean. We were known as the Yashuis at the Rogue, War Rogue Wars. Yashui was actually my uncle. He's a man, just a man, not the name of our people. He was my great-great-great-grandfather's uncle. He was the head man of the North Village at the time, and a great warrior. He was also a good spiritual man, as were all my ancestors. I'm going to read to you from the book Two Spirit People, Native American Gender, Identity, Sexuality, and Spirituality. Edited by Sue Allen Jacobs, Wesley Thomas, and Sabine Lang. Uh, the book here is specifically to speak on our northwestern California extending into the southern Oregon coast culture of two-spirit diversity, specifically speaking here about uh, what they call burdash or cross-dressing shamans. Um, these are the terminologies of the book that I'm reading. So I'm going to read from uh, this book an example here, excerpt about a man. Um, he's listed as a man, and his name is Sam Brown. He was a hoopa. Beginning. My final example of a cross-dressing medicine man is Sam Brown, a half-white hoopa who was the son of Dan McLeod, and Hoopa Judy Hostler, born on December 15, 1879. The first record of him dates from 1886, when he was about eight. He lived in Hostler Ranch, in a household headed by his mother, Judy. Some years later, Sam, Sam Brown, dressed as a female, lived as a self-employed seamstress in Blue Lake, a predominantly white mill town near Hoopa, until her slash his logging boots gave him away as a quote unquote male during a community dance. On May 11th, 1910, Sam Brown was living in a two person household with his single, allegedly full blood niece Blanche, then listed as 23 and an English speaker. Sam Brown stated that many of the texts were based upon dream experiences. Oh, sorry. I got it. Oh, I skipped a part. Okay, going back. In 1927, Edward Sapir recorded Sam Brown and wrote of him as a man caught between two worlds. Keeling, 1992, citing Gola in press. See also Keeling, 1992. Victor Gola noted that Brown, Sam Brown, Hoopa, stated that many of the texts were based upon dream experiences, that the text typically mentioned clouds, fog, birds, or, or recorded uh, or other things related to the sky. Apparently, Sapir recorded only two songs from Sam Brown. One was a formula and song for good luck with re words referring to Don Maiden, who lives in the east where the sun rises. The other was a formula and war song concerning Black Hawk, who lives with his sisters on Redwood Ridge. Both recordings apparently have been lost. From 1929 through 1937, Sam Brown is listed as living alone and being single. The year 1937 is the last Bureau of Indian Affairs census that lists Sam Brown. The decennial U.S. census of 1930, 1940, and 1950 are not yet available to the public. From the 1930s into the 1950s, Sam Brown was the main Hoopa formulas medicine man in the mid-1940s. He was interviewed by ethnographers William Wallace and Edith Taylor. Sam Brown died on February 18, 1958. His death certificate listed his last occupation as cook at Brizard's restaurant in Hoopa. Also on the certificate is the entry, Never Married. 
provided by his nephew, which is in quotes here, James Jackson. Several who knew Sam Brown have mentioned that he was gay. The records give no indication that he ever lived as other than a member of his natal household or alone. Sam Brown's cross-dressing seems to have been an idiosyncratic pattern of a half-white male. It was much later in life that he became a medicine man, as the community formulas for the white deerskin and jump dances are called in northwestern California. Men who were also specialists in mental health and spiritual caring. In summary, the four instances of cross-dressing, Zuni, Wapato, Toloa, and Hupa consisted of Wapato and Hupa occurrences that seemed to have been individualistic, as were the two dissimilar usages followed by Zuni females, whereas nearly all of the male Zuni and both Toloa instances were part of more generally practiced local traditions of cross-dressing, transvesticism, and two-spirit identity, as these books use this terminology. So now that we have read from the book, Two-Spirit People, Native American Gender Identity, Sexuality, and Spirituality, I just want to talk about that a little bit. So um, the Browns are a people that um, I'm related to. Oscar Brown is Sam Brown's, I believe, cousin or brother. And um, Oscar Brown married my great-great-auntie who went to go live in Tolo country. Um, Speaking on this tradition, though, being a two-spirit person in a modern era, right, and be you anywhere on the LGBTQ plus spectrum, it, it doesn't matter. If you're a two-spirit person and you're indigenous, this is your tradition here in the Southern Oregon, uh, Costa Northern California Territory. I just want to reread this last part that says, whereas nearly all of the Tolua instances of this two-spirit tradition were part of more generally practiced local traditions. So if you are Lower Rogue to Tutni, uh, Chekko, Pistol, Toloa, these are your traditions. And so you can know that today you and your identity are doing what's right by your traditions. So be proud and stand on your two-spirit feet. Show who you are because you're honoring your ancestors when you do that. You see, we've got ancestors here in the 19th century. You know, they got those ancestors and traditions from the 17th century. We got them from the 16th century. And it goes back and back into the mists of time when we were created on this land out of clay and grass on that little white sand island where Creator and the Watcher were. So you just got to know that Creator made you this way. And he made you to be a spiritualist and a medicine person, to be honored in the old traditions. And so anybody who says, well, I, you know, I honored the ancestors, but, you know, that's just not for me, is, well, just basically cutting out, you know, that entire population saying, you're not a part of my tribe. So don't let them get to you. They choose to disinclude themselves from the whole tribe, which you've always belonged to and will always belong to. And I believe we are growing into a time when this two-spirit tradition can be honored openly again and celebrated in our tribes more openly as it has been growing in the past couple decades, maybe even 30 years. I don't know. It's been a long, slow struggle, but we're here and we're alive. So stand proud, be two-spirit, and know that you got big medicine in you. And Creator put it there. And you go to those mountain places, just like it says here. The mountain holds the power. And I tell you, when you go up there, those spirits know you already intimately and deeply. They've been waiting so long since that last two-spirit ancestor walked there and got that spirit power. You might even get their name. You know, somebody may recognize that power and go, oh, Man, I see that. That's, that reminds me of my great uncle who had that power so long ago. That's a tradition too, but we'll talk about that at another time. <laughs> so go to your big power places in the mountains. Be big, powerful, two-spirit people. Hold your chin up high when you speak your language. And always have proud, proud, proud in your chest, in your heart for all your traditions. All your traditions. Be proud. Shum.